Hello, everyone. My name is Dietu Kasui, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to the kickoff of the 2022 uh, VACUPATH, the Virginia Association of Chapters of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Leadership Academy in partnership with Urban Financial Services Coalition's DMV Interest Group. We're so excited to come back and have Our second seat with Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, uh, Mr. Kevin Glover. Brother Glover, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Brother Kasuli. And uh, good evening, everyone. And welcome again to the 2022 uh, Summer Leadership Series kickoff. Um, as Brother Kasui has stated, my name is Kevin Glover. I am the Chief of Commissions here for the Virginia Association of Chapters of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, known as VACAPATH. And on behalf of the VACAPATH District Director, Brother Fred Scott, and his executive leadership team, I would like to personally welcome all of you to the session on the Leadership Academy's Summer Leadership Program Series Number 1, titled Leading Self. VACAPATH, in partnership with the Urban Financial Services Coalition, understands the value in developing leaders of tomorrow. And I'm excited, as I'm sure our district director is, to have our very own Lieutenant General Daryl Williams here as our featured speaker for the evening. So I want to thank the brothers of the Leadership Academy, Brother Kasui, Brother Jones, Brother Allen, Brother Stanislaus, and Brother Wilkerson for putting this all together. And again, everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I hope you all find this program to be very enriching and enlightening. Thank you so much, Brother Kasui. Uh, back to you, sir. All right. Thank you so much, Brother Glover. Uh, let's give Brother Glover a big round of applause in the chat. Can we get some clap claps in the chat? You know, he is from Georgia. And so the people in Georgia are still celebrating. Uh, for the national championship, those bulldogs, <laughs> they are still barking. They are still barking uh, down there in Georgia. And, and, uh, and my Atlanta Braves, sir. I, I have, the, I have two. two times. That's two right, two times. times. Two times. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, Brother Glover set the foundation for the discussion uh, today, which is really about leadership from the perspective of personal leadership. And so this series is going to be focused on how you can take your personal leadership to the next level. And so throughout the next four to six weeks, we're going to have various speakers who will be talking about developing yourself as a leader in your ability to lead yourself. The foundational piece of all leadership is your ability to effectively know your values, determine what you want your future vision to be and create and execute a plan to be able to achieve your vision um, that you're trying to accomplish in your personal life and at work. Um, and also, you know, leaders have to be able to work collaboratively uh, with others. So we're excited about all the, the speakers that we're gonna have, but we have a very special um, speaker today. Uh, so but, but before we do that, I'll give one, we have two minutes of reflection and the reflection, what I'd like for you to do is to put in the chat your number one best practice for leading yourself, your number one best practice. What is one thing that you do to effectively lead yourself as a leader? So if you had to recommend to someone a best practice for leading themselves, go ahead and put that in the chat. And while you are putting that in the chat, I am going to reach out to my really good friend from uh, Kansas City, Missouri, um, Dr. Andre Red. Uh, Dr. Red, if you are in position, I would like to throw it to you to, to share one of uh, your best practices um, for helping people to effectively lead themselves. Uh, Dr. Red? Might be still on mute, Dr. Red. That, um, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Red. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, D2. I, I would say don't allow your limitations to limit you. And because I am a man that loves God, I certainly have learned to not allow my limitations to limit him. Wow, that's powerful. I, I don't think Anthony needs to go beyond, beyond that. <laughs> that's excellent. Absolutely. Don't let your limitations limit you. And I like to, we got a couple things in the chat. John Finnis, he says, finding time to calm thoughts. You know, having time to think is a practice that has gone by the wayside. You know, for so many of us, people tell us what to think. And oftentimes we have lost the ability to think for ourselves. And developing that ability to critically think and think for ourselves is very important. Annette Ross says maintaining an organized schedule. Time blocking is definitely a good secret. Morning meditation. Thank you. Uh, Maria Dwayne said, don't think too highly <laughs> of yourself. That's right. Some people's heads are so big they can't even get through the door. Um, so thank you. Got some excellent things. Michelle Hammond says prayer and reflection. Uh, Vanessa Womack says emotional intelligence. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so now that we kind of laid the foundation, I'd like to bring up my colleague from Urban Financial Services Coalition, um, this wonderful young lady in the D.C. market um, who has done so many um, big things. She had an opportunity um, to work. Uh, she works as a senior vice president with Operation Hope. Um, she's also has worked in the White House. She's worked on significant legislation for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, even when we went through the economic crisis. And she's a great friend of the DMV um, interest group of Urban Financial Services Coalition and a wonderful friend of the Richmond chapter. And she's a graduate of Howard uh, University. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause for my colleague, and friend who will introduce our speaker, Ms. Janae Roscoe. Hello, Yay! everybody. It's all about Hampton today, though. <laughs> it, is an honor. <laughs> it is an honor. I don't know how I got picked, but I am very excited and honored for this opportunity. Um, my parents were in the higher education industry. My mother used to be and was the first interim president of NAFIO. And it was under that as a little kid, I was able to hang out with the Harvey family. We're excited about his retirement. And I have a cousin on the on here, Andrea Mickle, who's the president and CEO of Minority Access, and she's a Hamptonian. Um, I put in the chat his bio, 13th president for Hampton University, alumnus, retired three-star general, Lieutenant um, General Daryl uh, Williams is going to do a fantastic job uh, for Hampton University. I don't wanna bore you with all of that um, because it's nothing to be bored about, but let's talk facts. How many people on this Zoom call has somebody in their family who went to Hampton, worked at Hampton, has a Hamptonian story? I know everybody on here has a Hampton story. See, I knew it, I knew it. And even though I went to Howard University, on both my family side, we have dear associations with higher education and with Hampton University. In my family, um, President elect Lieutenant General Darrell Williams, we are three generations strong of Hamptonians. The, uh, my grandparents did not go to college, but they owned a farm home and a town home, 200 acres never graduated from high school. They had nine children and they sent their kids to Hampton. <laughs> and their kids sent their people to Hampton. And one of them is on, on here, Andrea Mickle. And so I'm sure I'm not the only one here who can tell a story just like Daryl Williams, a, an alumnus of Hampton University that has a legacy of people from their family and friends who are associated with Hampton University. It is a beloved institution uh, in the state of Virginia. It's well honored. My, my uncle was the ninth president of Virginia Union University. So we are proud of the legacy 
of HBCUs and in particular in the state of um, Virginia. We are here to hear from him, to applaud him, to, to let him know that we are praying for him and that we already have Hampton love for him and that he knows that the banking and financial service community as well as the um, divine nine community as well as the federal government worker entity community stands by his new legacy of, of work that will be there at Hampton. We applaud all that you and your family have done to get to this point. And just know that on behalf of the team that is here, we are a group of leaders in so many respective communities that we have your back. We're praying for you and we will be here to support your leadership. Thank you, D2, for giving me an opportunity and an honor to say before it happens, congratulations. And I had to make sure at least one of my Hantonian family members was on this call, Andrea Mickle. I don't know if you want to say something really quick, Andrea, but this is a big honor in our family to um, be able to know who you are, to be on this call and to sell you Godspeed, we're here with you, as well as our UFSC family. Andrew, you want to say something real quick? We can't hear you. You got to take your thing off mute. Yes. There you go. Just to say that all of the pirates are behind you, um, <laughs> General Williams, and we're expecting great things from you. So, but as Janae said, we have your back and we wish you well. Over to you, D2. Over to you, General. Uh, well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, and so to Jenna uh, and Andrea and, and any other Hampton Pirates that might be out there, thank you all for being on the call tonight. Uh, I can't tell you how excited both I and my wife, Myra, by the way, who's also a Hampton graduate. We both graduated in 1983. And then just a couple of other um, um, interesting factoids. Uh, we met at Hampton, we were both psychology majors. And some of you will remember if you were at Hampton, Dr. Connolly was sort of our model. Uh, my wife sang in the concert choir for four years on the Roland Carter. Uh, I was with Dr. Greer Wilson in the student leadership program my entire time there. Uh, spent four years in the ROTC program. Uh, I was Mr. Freshman my freshman year, uh, senior class president my senior year. Um, I say all of that to just talk about what a, an absolutely wonderful and completely fulfilling experience that we had at Hampton University and it indeed set the foundation for everything else that we have done in our lives. And I can't tell you how much it means for us to be going back to a school, a university that has done so much for us and our families and our community. And so a couple of other factoids, my wife Myra is a Delta. Uh, and I know I, I just heard somewhere out there go, oop, I get it. Uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. And at Hampton, both of those chapters are Gamma Iota. Uh, also interesting is that my line number was number six and my wife's number, line number the same year, 1981, was line number six. Um, my wife will be the first uh, alumnus of the university to serve as first lady. And we will be the first couple uh, in the history of the university to serve as the president and first lady of the university. There, there have been other uh, presidents who were alum. And so just a lot of very, very interesting, uh, I think factoids. Uh, and we're so delighted to be headed back to our beloved home by the sea. And so before I talk about uh, the topic this evening of leadership and leading, leading yourself, I wanted to give you a little bit more background about me, uh, more background than I would ever be able to give 
at a speech or some other presentation. But for me, it's so foundational to me having this discussion about leadership. I need you to understand the context uh, within which I will make my comments. And so I'm from West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, I'm also from a family of nine children, uh, much like your grandparents, uh, Jenna. And uh, I have five older sisters and three uh, brothers, two older brothers, one younger brother. And so one of the things you'll, you'll have to understand in terms of my dynamics is when you grow up in a household with a very strong mother figure and five older sisters, you learn very quickly that you're not in charge. And so at every rank that I achieved within the military and my sisters attended the ceremony, they never fail to let me know that I don't care how many stars you get, you're still my little brother. And that persists until this very day. And I would tell you that it has had a shaping effect on my leadership style and what I believe about leadership in general. You have to learn how to follow before you can learn how to lead. And so that's kind of tip number one. I think good followership is a requisite for good leadership and personal accountability and leading self. Uh, I grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida, um, and I grew up during uh, desegregation, which had a big impact. So my first three years in elementary school in the late 1960s, I went to an all black elementary school, Roosevelt Elementary. And so we're all a part of the same community where and many of you have had this experience where every teacher in the school knows your family. They know all of your brothers and sisters that came through. They know your mom and dad because they went to all of the PTA meetings and so forth. Many of us all went to the same church. And that was my formative experience. My fourth grade year, we started busing. And I went to a different school, North Moore. And my fifth grade year, I went to a different school. The busing changed again. And I went to a school called Green Acres. My sixth grade year, my family moved and I ended up going to yet another school, Palm View Elementary School. My seventh grade year, they desegregated further and I went to a school called Palm Beach Public. And then my eighth grade year, I went to Roosevelt Junior High School. And finally, after all of that commotion in the early years of my education and life, I went to the same high school for four years. Uh, my mother was big on church. And so like many of you perhaps, there wasn't a discussion about uh, whether or not you were going to church. It was a fact. And if you didn't go to church, nothing else good was gonna happen that day. And so you weren't going to the movies when you got home, if you didn't go. You weren't going to play with your friends. You weren't stepping foot outside of that door. If you didn't have enough time to go to church, then you obviously didn't have enough time to go and do anything else. And so uh, it was simpler to just go to church, whether you wanted to or not. Um, and in that church, uh, I learned a lot of things that have remained with me for the rest of my life. I grew up singing in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the junior choir, the men's choir. I served on the junior usher board, the men's usher board all throughout my uh, upbringing. And perhaps among the other more formative experiences that some of you will relate to, you went to Sunday school. And Sunday school started at you know, 9.30 and you got divided out into your classes and then the last 30 minutes of Sunday school, one student was chosen from each class to give up and give a summary of what you learned in Sunday school that morning. And as I look back on that experience, that was probably my first experience in getting up in front of people and learning how to project with confidence, learning to articulate, and all of those important lessons that I thought were incidental were in fact very, very deliberate. And on Easter Sunday and on Christmas, 
Leah, uh, there was a Christmas program. Every child had a speech and you had to learn your part and participate in the Christmas play. And so all of those things are part of why I think I'm returning to Hampton University, right? I have a love for sports. Um, so when I was growing up in South Florida, there was only one team. In football, it was the Miami Dolphins. That's just the way it was. I mean, the 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 great 1972 Miami Dolphin football team is the only team in history to have a perfect season. I was in the arena that day with the Boy Scouts when Deacon Jones from the San Diego Chargers broke through the Dolphins' front line and broke Bob Greasy's ankle, and Earl Morrow came in and took him to the postseason. Bob Greasy came back, and we had the undefeated season. And so that's the kind of memories that I have for my community. The other great team was the Miami Hurricanes. Everybody was in love with the U. And to this day, I still follow the Miami Dolphins and the Miami Hurricanes because it is my connection to South Florida, uh, certainly along with my family. Uh, I was on the speech and debate team. And in 1979, I won the state championship for extemporaneous speaking on the speech and debate team, and also for the Future Business Leaders of America, FBLA. Uh, I ran track for three years. I was a pretty good track athlete. I played basketball all my life. I loved Dr. J and Magic Johnson. And I knew that I was gonna be going to the NBA, but somewhere along the way, I had to get off that train. And, um, I finally, uh, in 1979, uh, uh, fall of 1978, I guess it was, got approached by a gentleman who was our guidance counselor, who was a Hampton graduate. And I knew nothing about applying to college, absolutely nothing. Uh, of nine children, I was the first to go away to school. Some of my brothers and sisters uh, got their degrees after they, uh, they uh, went to the game of life, but I was the first one to get the chance to go. And it wasn't because they weren't smart enough. It's just that the time was right. And I was an idea whose time had come for our family. And so in 1979, my entire family took me down to the Amtrak train station in West Palm Beach, Florida and put me on the train with two foot lock, with one foot locker and two suitcases. And I got on the train and went to Richmond, Virginia. And in Richmond, I transferred to the Greyhound bus. I took the Greyhound bus from Richmond to Hampton and took a cab from Hampton, downtown Hampton Greyhound bus station onto campus, enrolled and went to college. Not a single family member went with me we couldn't afford for anyone to travel with me. I went to Hampton sight unseen. I'd never been to Hampton, Virginia in my life. And, um, and that's how my journey at Hampton University began at James Hall on the fifth floor, penthouse gym. And I had such a wonderful experience. One of the first people I met was my big sister which remains a tradition at Hampton University, you get assigned a big sister or a big brother that's an upperclassman. And mine was Leah Crocker, she was a Delta. And I couldn't go home to West Palm Beach, Florida for Thanksgiving, didn't have enough money. And so guess what? My big sister and her brother who was also a freshman took me back to New Jersey to their home for Thanksgiving. And that's, the kind of experience that I had throughout my time at Hampton University and in the ROTC program. And uh, I tell you all of these things uh, for two reasons. One, to talk about leadership, and I'll weave all of this in in a minute, but also to tell you why I'm headed back to the home by the sea. Um, Everything surrounding this process of me being selected to go to Hampton, the common sense solution says, you spent 37 years in the military. Uh, we bought a home here in Alexandria, Virginia two years ago. I promised my wife that 
when we retired from the military, she could choose the home that we we're gonna live in. She chose the home. That's where we are. We've uh, put a lot of money into making it the way that she wants it. I've been working in corporate America for the last two years, doing very, very well, uh, probably on track to do some big things in that arena. My daughter and her husband live 20 minutes away from us. Uh, she's 31 years old, and although we're not applying any pressure, we are expecting big things to happen in the not too distant future. Uh, our son uh, lives and works in New York. And I say all of that to say that we're settled, we're doing well. And if this was all about just about us, the common sense thing to do is to stay here in Northern Virginia. But when the home by the sea starts calling and asking you to come back and share some of what you have and some of what it has given you, it's almost an impossible call to ignore. And so went through the entire application process, got chosen to do so, and we are so excited to go back to the home by the sea. And I assure you that it's not about us. If I don't do anything else in my life, we attain the rank of three-star general. So it's not about us. There, there are no more accolades for us. This is about our love for the home by the sea. It's about the fact that we believe that our steps have been ordered to do this in some way. And it's about us coming back to give a little bit of what the university has given to us. So how does all of this weave into leadership? And what, how does all of this talk about leading yourself? And so I believe that, uh, that, uh, that you have some slides, I believe, um, uh, D2, that you can put up on the screen. And I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. I will use them as a guide, uh, but I will not talk about each and every one of them individually. And so what I will, what I will simply say is this, uh, some time ago, I tried, I, I got asked a question so many times when I was in the military, how is it that you achieved the rank that you did? What is it that you did? Can you tell us what the secret was? How did you do it? And so what I did over time was to sit down and really take an account of what I believe was most important in my life and how it pertained to leadership. But in my view, you have to start with your life priorities before you can talk about your leadership priorities because your life affects your leadership. Your life affects your leadership. And so I'm not telling anyone else that your life priorities or your leadership priorities have to be the same as mine. What I'm telling you is that these are mine. They're foundational to who I am. And I will tell you that they continue to evolve. Uh, I'm not the same person today that I was 10 years ago. And so this will change again as I consider going to Hampton University, but there are some core fundamentals. So let me, let me start at the top, my life priorities. And so first and foremost, and again, I'm not trying to impose my values or my priorities on anybody else. I'm telling you about Daryl Williams. First and, for, and, and foremost, it's about strong faith. Um, and I said, I would weave this into the Hampton story, right? And so according to the search firm that did the search that selected me to be the next president, there were 300 applicants. So how does a person who doesn't have a PhD and limited experience in the academic leadership space eventually emerge as the candidate to be the president of Hampton University. And all I can tell you is this, even if I wanted to, there's no way that Daryl Williams could have orchestrated this. This is about something much bigger than me. 
And I have faith that because it's happened in that way and that I am being um, honest to the call that the right things are going to happen. I've guided my entire life in this way and I see no reason to change right now. But I just tell you that at the very top of the list for me, it is about strong faith. Look, I wanna, I wanna stop very short of anyone believing that I'm some perfect Christian. I am not, I am a flawed man. I have as many or more flaws as anybody else on this call and anywhere else. I would merely say that I do in fact have a very strong faith. The next thing uh, on the list, uh, if it can go back up on the screen, is family and close friends. One of the things that I have learned over time is that each of us, in addition to our faith, faith has to have a power source that you plug into. And throughout my travels, and as I look at my very large family, and when I say large, I do in fact mean large, of those uh, in, in my family, if I count my nieces and nephews, my great nieces and nephews and great greats, um, I could stop counting at 150. And so I have a very large family. So what I would tell you is that I've learned that no one is going to love you like your family and your close friends. And to me, family is not necessarily just about blood. Family is about relationships. There are people outside of my blood relatives who love me and whom I love more deeply than I do anything in this world. And so that's where you remain grounded. It's where you continue to help develop your values. It's where you get ground truth. It's where people tell you what you don't necessarily want to hear sometimes. But family and close friends. And the next one directly relates to leading yourself. And it's this issue, and it's right at the top of the list, of personal accountability. You can't lead unless you're willing to hold yourself personally accountable. Look, I think any and all of us can look in the news cycle today and look at all kinds of people who are very smart, very accomplished, and they're from all walks of life. And yet they're divorced from personal accountability. Uh, I've tried to, and I'm not 100% successful, Again, I admit to being a flawed person. Much of this for me is as aspirational as it is true. But what I do know is that if you want to have uh, the kind of positive impact as a leader, as I think all of you on this call want to have, there is this personal accountability, your heritage and culture. Uh, one of the things that resonates with me about going back to Hampton University is this aspect of it being a part of our nation and our community's heritage and culture. In addition to the academic experience that a student will have and that I had and that some of you in the call have had, in addition to the being a world-class academic institution, it does add a cultural aspect to that that is very difficult to find anywhere else. I stop short of saying that it's any better or any worse than any other academic experience. My two children, one went to William and Mary, the other went to University of Virginia. They didn't want to go to Hampton. They had a completely different experience. But what I do know is the Hampton and the HBCU experience writ large uh, gives you a cultural as well as an academic experience that caters to the whole person. And I think when you leave behind your heritage and your culture, you're leaving behind a portion of yourself. This doesn't just pertain to HBCUs and to black people. I think this pertains to everyone, I hope, that if you're an Irish American, that you're proud of your Irish heritage. I hope that if you're a Native American, that you're proud of your Native American. I hope 
that you're, if you're Latino, that you're proud of your heritage and culture because it is part and parcel of who you are. And so I'm very, very proud of saying that I'm a black American, that I'm an African American. It's part of who I am. That shouldn't threaten anyone. I don't think it's better than anyone or anyone else, but it is part of who I am. And I would be remiss if I tried to move away from that. I'm proud of it, I wear it, and I hope that everyone does the same thing with their own heritage and culture, as long as it does not impact negatively someone else's equities. Next, love of country. Look, I spent 37 years in the military defending our nation, traveling all over the world, been to places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Kosovo, all over the Middle East. And I have placed my life on the line and watch so many others place their lives on the line. My grandfather served in World War I and World War II. My father served in World War II. My uncle served in World War II. My cousin served in Korean War. My brother was in the Vietnam War. My sister served during the Vietnam era. My brother, I have another brother who served uh, over the last 20 years or so in the Florida National Guard. And I've spent 37 years defending our nation. She's not perfect. She's not perfect, but she's still the best the world has ever seen. And after having traveled to over 50 countries during my life and career, there's still nowhere else that I would rather live than our great nation. And so, yes, I love our nation as much as I love our community. And I, for one, will continue to fight for her and to try and make her be her very best. Dedication to your profession. Um, I will tell anyone that I think that a prerequisite for being the best at what you do is to be dedicated to it, whatever it is that you choose to do. And so if you choose to be a doctor or a lawyer, you would expect that person to be dedicated to it because other people's lives are on the line. If you wanna be an electrician, if you wanna be an architect, if you wanna be an engineer, if you wanna be someone who makes furniture or whatever it is in life that motivates you, I simply say be dedicated to it. The next one is selfless service and giving back is a life priority of mine, making a difference. And then of course, we all want some measure of financial stability and security for ourselves. So I would say in a, in, a, in a nutshell, these are not the only things, but these are some of the great things that, that motivate me that are part of my life priorities. And I told you earlier that for me, this continues to evolve. And so as I started thinking about my journey of going back to Hampton University, the thing that I will add to this list is being a lifelong learner, being a lifelong learner and being excited about continuing to learn new things. And so it's one of the things that excites me most about this next chapter, to learn something new, to give something back, and to provide another level of selfless service. But probably that when I get to Hampton University, when you see this life priorities for Daryl Williams, it's probably going to include, include lifelong learning. Next, next, uh, next slide, please. The next thing I talk about then again is this whole issue of leadership. And all of this within this, it, is within the context of self-leadership because I think you have to take yourself on this reflective journey to decide what's important in your life and then how does that translate to your leadership. And so right at the top of the list for me is authenticity. You need to be, your leadership style, your being who you are as a leader has to reflect, in fact, who you are. Being authentic to yourself. I give that a caveat. 
The caveat is there are things about my level of authenticity and about being myself that may be appropriate in West Palm Beach, Florida, but it may not be appropriate for a broader audience or elsewhere. And so to the extent that you being authentic does not offend the sensibilities of someone else, you need to maintain a certain level of authenticity within your leadership style. I don't know how to be anyone else but Daryl Williams. And the philosophy that I've developed over time is I'm going to show you who I am and hopefully that's good enough. And if it's not, then we have to go our separate ways because I can't be anything other than who I am. As I think about our young people, our young people in high school, our young people in college, even those in elementary school. And as I think about my own children, I think the greatest gift that a parent or a university or school can give a child is to help them discover who their authentic self is and then to support that. My son chose not to go into the military, for example, and I often get asked the question, why didn't your son, you're a, a three-star general, why didn't your son go into the military? And to be quite frank with you, I'm happy that he did not. Just because dad, went into the military and had a successful career and was very, very fulfilled in what I was doing, doesn't mean that's authentically who my son is. My job as a father, my wife's job as a mother, our job as parents was to help him find out who his authentic self is, support it, and help him to reach his dreams, not my dreams. That's what I want to see happen at Hampton University. It always has. I certainly want to, as president, continue to make that happen. I see Hamptonians successful in every walk of life. I told you how many countries I've visited and rarely have I gone anywhere in my life where I didn't meet a Hamptonian. And those of you who have gone to Hampton, um, I, I think you would, you would echo those same sentiments. Let me drop down to vision. Um, and this is about leading yourself. It's about leading your family. It's about leading whatever organization you're a part of. Um, where there is no vision, the people will perish, right? And so one of my big responsibilities at Hampton, one of the biggest responsibilities I have of any organization that I take over is to help establish an initial vision and then not just a vision, but a strategy and a plan to accomplish that vision. But a vision without a plan is an hallucination. You're not going to accomplish anything, but it is the, it is the leader's responsibility to establish a vision and a plan. And again, I say, this is not just relevant to Hampton University. This is inside of your own family. What is your vision for what your children should ultimately achieve in life? What is your vision for where you want to be 10 years from now? And so it's not that you necessarily end up meeting that vision at times, but you have to have a vision, you have to have a plan. And yes, there will be bumps along the way. Yes, your vision might have to change, but you owe whatever organization or group that you're leading to have a vision. And then right on that same line, this is very passionate, very strong for me. There has to be this level of integrity. Uh, once you lose your integrity with an organization, you have just compromised your ability to lead. No one again will believe what it is that you say and do. And then I talk about humility. Um, I like to practice something, a phrase that I've coined called confident humility. I'm very confident in what I'm doing. I'm very confident that I have the skill, that I have the passion, that I have the necessary leadership to take an organization from where it is now, along with a vision well into the future, but I also possess the humility to understand that you can't do it by yourself, that you don't have all of the answers, that your best asset is to build a team. 
So I like to call it confident humility. Because at the same time, if you don't display confidence, people won't follow you. But at the same time, you've got to be humble. The next one I already gave away, uh, passion. Um, I have always believed, and I believe to this day, that people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. And if you don't have any passion surrounding what it is that you are attempting to accomplish, you can't expect anyone else to have it either. But that passion has to be infused with amount of confidence, uh, with, with a certain amount of competence. And so it's great to have passion surrounding something, but you need to have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to go along with that passion to make the vision and the strategy to come true. But I am a firm believer that you have to develop some level of excitement around what it is that you're trying to achieve. And so passion doesn't always mean that you're jumping up and down, that you're screaming, that you're talking in a loud voice. I've seen some of the quietest people that I know still leave with passion because people can see it in their approach. They can see it in their dedication. They can see it in how hard they work. Passion takes on different forms. But passion and competence, I think, are a big part of your personal leadership. The next one I talk about is the secret sauce. You know, I think you manage things, you lead people. You manage things and processes, you lead people. And the sooner in your leadership journey that you realize that the people really are the secret sauce the sooner you will uh, achieve success. What I have come to understand over the years is that my true responsibility as a leader is to invest in people and allow people to be the very best of themselves. And if you take care of the people, I promise you that the mission will happen. And so I started that philosophy, I guess, when I was a young lieutenant colonel, you know, 20 years ago in the US military. I've applied that philosophy and it has not failed me yet. I have been in purely military environments. Uh, many of you obviously know my long and distinguished military career and you say, well, that works in the military. It won't work anywhere else necessarily. I disagree with you. It worked in a purely military environment. I've also in work in environments where we had soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, that we also had half of our formation that were civilian contractors and another portion of this uh, formation, if you will, that were Department of Defense civilians. And it was as true in those organizations as it was in a purely military organization. And then I left and I went to Defense Logistics Agency for my culminating assignment where there were 26,000 people and 99.5% of those people were government civilian. And so I changed from, if you take care of the troops, the mission will happen to if you take care of the people, the mission will happen. But the fundamental principle remained exactly the same. And it produced the absolute same outstanding result. And then I brought that with me into my position in corporate America for the last two years. I currently spend 65% of my time in the United Kingdom, working and leading a very large logistics program where I am the only American assigned to the program and I am the managing director and we directly interface with the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense. And yet the same principle of taking care of the people on the program, being the instrument of producing outstanding results is as true there as it was at DLA, as it was when I was in a purely military organization. The sooner you understand that is part of your leadership responsibility is taking care of people, 
the sooner you'll figure out that uh, that's the element of your success. The other one I would say is no excuses. Uh, at the end of the day, your responsibility as a leader is to produce results. It's to produce results. And when you don't, no one wants to hear excuses. But I think it's all about preparation. Excellence is the standard, you know? At Hampton University, we talk all the time about a commitment to excellence. And I'm convinced that that's what sustained our university since 1868. The standard is excellence and everything. You can't choose what you want to be good at. What I've noticed about people that are very, very successful is that you typically are good at almost everything, or at least they are in the areas where they're not good, they're working on it. And so the standard really is excellent. Next one is be a mentor. I'm a firm believer and what I've learned throughout the course of my life and career is that the person who gets the most out of the mentor-mentee relationship is really the mentor. I learned more from the person that I'm supposed to be quote unquote mentoring than sometimes I believe that person learns from me. And so there is no shortage of people who come to me and ask, will you be my mentor? Many of you have the same experience. And one of the first questions I ask that person is, who are you mentoring? And often the person gets caught in mouth and, you know, abba daba. And, and so let me get this right. You want me to spend my time helping to develop you, but you're not willing to spend your time developing someone else. And as a practical matter, if you want to be mentored, go mentor someone else and you'll get more out of it than they do. The next thing I talk about is resilience. And so leadership is hard work, folks. It's not, it, it, it's not every day is going to be sugar and spice and everything nice. And every day is not gonna be filled with accolades and people patting you on the back and throwing rose petals in your path. There's some tough days. And sometimes you're gonna take a shot right in the chin, right in the mouth, right in the forehead. You're gonna take a direct shot, metaphorically speaking. The question is of the leader and, and, uh, and leading yourself, are you gonna get back up? Do you have the resilience to get back on the pony after you've been hit in the gut and ride? You're going to have bad days. And I take you back to the life priorities at this point. When you have those bad days, where do you go? You go back, right back to number one and number two on the list on the previous page, your strong faith and your relationship with your family and close friends. The two, in my view, go hand in glove. You are going to have bad days. Positivity, teamwork, and relationships. No one wants to follow someone who always has negative things to say. Your influence on a team has more to do with your passion and your positivity and your competence than it does all of the things you're pointing out that are wrong. Look, you have to be able to point out things that need to be improved. That's a necessary part of the job, getting down to the nitty gritty. And how do you know what you need to improve if you're not willing to face those issues head on? You have to do that. But at the end of the day, people want positivity. That's what draws them to your leadership along with a vision and a plan uh, and your level of competence. Teamwork, you can't get it done by yourself. And folks, as long as we're on this earth, I believe that it'll be about the relationships that you establish. Be consistent. Uh, I won't ask you to raise your hands because I already know the answer. But uh, rhetorically speaking, how many people in this call have worked for a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? You've had a boss where you walk in the door today and he or she is smoking and joking, having a great time, patting you on the back. And 15 minutes later, 
uh, it's as if it's a completely different person. And everyone in the office works on pins and needles because you don't know what mood the boss is in today. And it's hard to be your best and most productive self unless your boss is consistent. Well, I say you need to take that into your own leadership style as well. Try to be the same person every day. Try to be, do it with authenticity. Try to provide the people that you lead with consistency. And then the last one I talk about there is, folks, there are sacrifices to being a great leader. What do I mean by sacrifices? The leader of most organizations is typically going to be the hardest working person in the organization. The leader in an organization is probably the person who has to get there before everybody else and has a lot of work to do long after that person leaves. If you think you're going to be a great leader working nine to five, you're fooling yourself. You are going to spend some time most likely away from your family. You are going to spend some time away from activities that you'd rather be involved in with your children. You are going to have to work late at night to get that master's degree or that additional certification that's necessary to reach the next rung upon the ladder. You may have to move to a new city or a new state in order to get that job opportunity that you so richly want. You are gonna have to bend, uh, burn some midnight oil to both do your job and to help to mentor others. You are gonna have to on a Saturday afternoon when you would rather be relaxing out providing a service to the community. There is no such thing as wild success without some measure of sacrifice. And then the other one that I would put on this list, I told you I continue to evolve. And I kick myself because I feel this way, but I never put it on this card uh, until I was at a leadership retreat about three months ago with a bunch of other colleagues. And I realized someone said it and it struck me like a lightning bolt. Trust and loyalty, trust and loyalty. It, it's kind of like integrity, but the one that I will add to my leadership card and that's all about leading yourself is trust and loyalty. And it's a two-way street. Uh, certainly you want people that you can trust, but you must be trustworthy. Certainly we demand loyalty from other people in our relationship with them, but you owe loyalty in return. And so uh, folks, I've been talking for a very long time. I hope I didn't bore you to death. I think I'm finishing just about on time, maybe a little bit late, uh, D2. Uh, but those are my comments. Uh, and I'd love to take some questions uh, surrounding uh, leadership of self relative to the comments I've made about life priorities and then your leadership priorities. I rest my case. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Let's give the general a big round of applause for those excellent points. I remember the first time you shared these uh, with us, General. Um, I was one of those uh, employees of your 26,000 in the auditorium beaming with such pride when you walked in and, you know, they make an announcement. You know, those of you, you know, before the general walks in, they make the announcement that the general is walking in. And, you know, to be in, in DLA and uh, to be in the audience and they say, here comes the general. And to see someone that looked like me, to walk down the aisle, with that smooth walk and carry himself with the dignity and pride of the diaspora, you know, did me such pride. And then on top of that, you know, had to be the black and gold. It was, that was just the cherry. Oh, the <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So folks, if you have a question, go ahead and um, throw your question um, in the chat. Um, so we'll take your questions in the chat. If you uh, would like to verbally ask your question, you can go ahead and raise your hand and, and we will um, take a few questions. Uh, so General, I have a couple questions already came to me. 
um, that I'll go ahead and ask you. The first question um, that um, came to me is that in terms of developing uh, your leadership uh, priorities, you know, which one was the most difficult um, for you to develop or you think that you're still working on the most? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm, I'm looking at my card here. Which one was the most difficult? Um, I would say the, the, the one that I have to constantly be mindful of, I'll put it that way, is this, this fine line that I talked about being confident which can easily come across as cocky and turn people off and at the same time maintaining your humility. You know, when you become the director for DLA and when you hold some of the high level positions that I've been, um, that I've been privileged to, to hold. And when I go to Hampton University, people will very, quickly place you on a pedestal. And if you're not careful, you buy into all of the great things that are being said. And I've seen so many um, buy into all of the positive things that are being said. And before you know it, who you are begins to change. I try to always remember that what I am, three-star general, person working in corporate America, going to Hampton University as a president, uh, what you are is not the same thing as who you are as a person. What you have to guard against and what I'm constantly trying to guard against is losing who I am, regardless of what position that I go to. And so those core fundamentals that you saw me speak about on that, I constantly refer to those because I do not want to lose the core of who I am. That's one that for me is a lifelong endeavor. The, the one uh, 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 joke that, that, that I've heard that I think um, that, that I've heard that, that encapsulates it quite well is the higher up the flagpole you go, remember the more your butt is sticking out, right? So don't get too, don't get too bloated with yourself, right? Realize where your blessings come from. Realize that they can very easily and very quickly go away Realize that everything you do requires a team effort. Realize that you need to spread the wealth in terms of the accolades that go along with the achievements. And so I would say, for me, I work on being confident because people want confidence. If you're in a leadership position, people want the feeling that they can follow you, that you know what you're talking about, that you're worthy of their trust in you. At the same time, you have to remain humble. So I, I would say that is, for me, among the toughest things to balance. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, uh, General. That's one of the things that Benjamin Franklin had a hard time with too. He put that on his core values and he had eight core values and yeah. humility was the one that was a little problem. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I say as well, D2, that all of the things that I talked about are as aspirational as they are necessarily true. I don't claim to be 100% in any of those areas. They're all a work in progress for me, all of them. Copy that, copy that. All right, I see my good friend from California. Uh, Ms. Karen A. Clark. Karen, go ahead and ask your question for the gentleman. Well, first of all, D2 and UFSC, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to, um, to hear from this, 
this wonderful leader. And sir, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for your service to this country. I'm an Air Force brat. Both of my parents were in the Air Force. Um, my dad did 20. My mother did, you know, 15 civil service. Wow. And then, Amazing. you know, a reserve. she did 15 reserves and civil service. But I just want to say thank you because this is uh, such a rare opportunity and such a rare honor to be able to to sit and listen to someone of your stature who um, and we, there's so so very few of you um, in, in our community. Uh, what uh, maybe <laughs> how many <laughs> a few a very few in history that have ever reached uh, that level in our in our service. And I just thank you, thank you, and thank you for your continued service uh, to our community and to our uh, education. Let me ask you this. What's the weather? What part of California and what's the weather today? I'm in Los Angeles and it's uh, it's about 75 degrees. You're hurting me. You're really <laughs> hurting me right now. Well, I, knew I, was in New York. I was in New York last week in Dallas and they had comparable weather. So, you know. OK, maybe maybe good weather just follows you. Maybe that. <laughs> and Karen Clark is being very shy. She is a huge banking uh, CEO uh, or uh, leader out there. Wow. With Bank in California. She's been uh, working in the community reinvestment um, space and giving money back to causes that are very important. Wow. Thank you. Thank you and very I had much. the honor of working with Janae in Operation Hope and serving as a president wow. of a UFSC LA chapter for a number of yeah. years. But it's so good to see everybody on the phone. And again, sir, thank you so much. And thank your wife for us as well. I will. So, so let me uh, let me give you another little factoid about my wife. I think you all will enjoy this. And I, uh, D two, I hope you won't turn me in because this was probably my earliest misuse of government uh, resources. But when I was in ROTC at Hampton University, I was the uh, the commander of a little ranger group called the Raiders, and we would get up and train every Tuesday and Thursday morning at five thirty. And we would do our physical training and we go for a run and we sing all of that great army cadence. And then uh, typically when we got on campus, we would kind of go a little bit quiet. Well, I wanted, uh, I wanted to date uh, who's now my wife and she lived in a dorm that those who've been to Hampton before call Holly Tree. And I told her that if she didn't go on a date with me, then when we came through at 5.30 in the morning, I was gonna call her out. And so sure enough, we're, we're running up the backside of Holly Tree and uh, I'm in charge of the formation of about 40 people. And I'm saying, wake up Myra, wake up, wake up Myra. And so she runs to the window in absolute horror. And I've woken up all of the girls in her dorm they're all mad. And I told her that will persist <laughs> until you agree to go out on a date with me. And we're married 35 years later. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, General, for sharing that. Uh, we have Craig uh, Marshbanks um, from Chicago. Craig, go ahead with your question. You're on, you're on mute, uh, Craig. Sorry about that. Good evening, Brother Kasui. Thank you for organizing. Brother Williams, thank you for uh, your discussion. Uh, I did have uh, one question, and I, you know, this is a, a huge task that you're undertaking, uh, where you will essentially have to change the culture, uh, potentially at uh, Hampton University. Uh, so my question is, do you have any advice for? us on the, on the call who are working to implement positive change within our organization uh, and are faced with a number of hurdles with folks who don't want to change, uh, who you know, are happy with the status quo. So any, you know, so whether yeah, you're, you know, your plan for- Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is a mouthful and, and, and certainly, I have been in and out of many organizations where we have certainly had that challenge. And it, it is difficult because you can change climate. It's much more difficult to change culture. I think the culture is a much more deeply 
embedded concept than merely climate. And so I'm always careful to make that distinction because changing a culture takes a bit more time. Let me give you some of the elements of what I believe you have to do in order to change both the climate first and then ultimately the culture. So the first thing is I think that when you come in as a leader, um, you have to uh, gain the confidence of the people that you lead uh, with regard to your purpose within that uh, organization. So as soon as people get the feeling that you're just in it for you and that you're not, you're there to punch a ticket, you're gonna be a short-term solution. You're going to reach the next rung on the corporate ladder and then you're going to depart. They have no reason to change their behavior. So the first thing that most employees in any organization you go to want to understand from the person that's in charge is how invested are you one in the mission? And probably more important, how much are you vested in their own career development? And so what are you going to do for them? How, how do you make them better? And so the first thing you have to demonstrate to me uh, in my view is a commitment to the mission and a commitment to the people that help to help you achieve that mission. So what are some of the things that show that commitment? And so the first thing is, I truly believe that establishment of the vision and a, uh, and a, and a strategy and plan is absolutely critical. But here's the piece you gotta put in there. You must ensure that there is a critical people element of your plan and you must ensure that your people help you to develop the plan. If you write the plan or bring in an outside organization and just writes it, makes a nice, beautiful, glossy, uh, without the involvement of the people with whom you work, you will not get their buy-in and you have little to no chance of changing either the climate or the culture. Next. I don't care how long most people have been with an organization, whether they've been there for one year, two year or 15 years, most people are still concerned about their development or their career path. Sitting down one-on-one -on -one with the people that report directly to you to gain an understanding of what their objectives are within that organization and longer term pays phenomenal dividends. Whether you can deliver on everything they want or not, I won't say it's immaterial, but the fact that you listened and that you took an interest is in and of itself an instrument of beginning to change uh, the culture. Next, I think if you're going to be there for a while, you have to do a culture climate survey. You have to uh, um, and most organizations have an instrument that is already in place to do that. Others, you may have to bring in someone, but you have to understand what some of the systemic and historic grievances of the workforce are. And then you have to develop a plan to address them. And it's gotta be a serious plan. It can't just be a talk over plan, it's a serious plan. And then you have to make sure that you're seeing to people's you know, career development and trying to fix some of the systemic things that may be wrong within the organization. To me, those are some of the starting points, making sure that you're dedicated to the mission, making sure that you acknowledge the great work of the people that are there, uh, making sure you understand the challenges that are faced, make sure you develop a vision, strategy, and plan, making sure you're doing the culture climate survey that allows you to get after some of the things that have to happen. Next, I would say that everyone likes to be a winner, right? So if you're new to an organization, getting some quick wins never hurts. It points to your potential um, 
competence as a leader. Um, you've got about 90, in my view, to 120 days into an organization where you still got that brand new car smell on you and people are willing to listen to you. It's before they think they figured you out. You really wanna kind of do those big things. I think in those first 90 to 120 days, and it doesn't hurt if you can get, you know, sort of some quick wins. Um, and then last, I would just say, you've got to invest in people. You have to invest in people if you want to change the culture. If it's just work and there is no investment in your people, you're not going to get the best out of them. It'll be a very transactional relationship and the culture will remain exactly the same. Those are some of the fundamental building blocks from my perspective. I hope that answers a portion of your question. Uh, thank you so much, General. Um, so folks, we, I'm, we're going to take two more questions and we'll have to let the general go. Um, there's so many questions in here, uh, <laughs> general people would ask. I gave a couple quick ones. Uh, newly elected uh, president of the Z Delta Lambda chapter, uh, Ronald Dews, uh, says, when creating a vision for an organization, uh, do you draw solely from yourself or is it more collaborative with your team? Um, and um, he's asking this question because he wants to know how critical is buy-in. Um, I am by nature collaborative in my approach, and I think it is the right approach. Example, when I first got to DLA in 2017, it took me six months to help build the plan. And I'm very fond of saying, and I believe it is not Darrell Williams' plan, it's DLA's plan. So who was involved in establishment of the first uh, I did put down my initial thoughts based upon uh, all of the homework I'd done prior to getting there. But then I uh, invited in my senior leadership team, number one, uh, from all across the organization, not just one section, not just the operations section. It was finance, it was HR, it was operations, it was procurement. Next, I even brought in um, some of our suppliers you know, DLA is an organization that deals with about 14,400 suppliers. I even let suppliers have a say-so in our plan. I also brought in very junior people within our organization. I specifically targeted people that have been in an organization for five years or less. And so when we got to about a 60 to 70% solution, I paid their their way to come to the headquarters and spend a week going over to the plan. And they gave me from some phenomenal feedback that ultimately helped to improve the plan. And then I brought in our customers. We got to about 75%. I let select individuals in our customer base read our plan. At the end of the day, it is collaborative. You're gonna have a better plan with more buy-in, the more people, and the more stakeholders you invite into its development. And then when it's done, and we develop all of the metrics surrounding the achievement that has to go into reaching the vision, my comment is always, I, I didn't develop this plan. You developed this plan. And now you must be bought into making it come to fruition. You're always, always, always better off getting buy-in, building it from as broad a tent as possible uh, to develop your strategic plan and vision. God bless you. Uh, General, thank you so much. We appreciate. I got to uh, take one more. You said two. I gotta okay. take one. <laughs> there's a well, guy named Travis who's got his hand up a long time. Copy that. So Travis McClenney, uh, you get the last question. All right. Travis. You, you might be still on mute. Yes, yes, I am here. I was actually trying to get my video going for a moment. Uh, so greetings, everyone, and welcome to HU, President Williams, um, Travis McClinney, uh, former student, graduate of Hampton University, and a member of the men's basketball team. I wanted to say I appreciate all of your comments today and everything, and I really wanted to get on this call to let you know that if you don't know already, you're not in this alone, and I want to be an ally. I want to introduce myself as someone that can be supportive in your endeavors. 
I support your leadership already. And I just wanted to introduce myself as a former, again, uh, men's basketball player and an advocate for Hampton University. And I uh, just want to again say thank you, welcome, and I look forward to meeting you in person and supporting you along the way. Hey, Travis, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I'll just say this, don't, don't make me have to put on my skipper chucks. Oh boy, oh, I like that, lace them up. <laughs> hey, don't, don't, don't make me have to back you down now. <laughs> all right, all right, I no, take that. It's, it's all, no, I, I really, I, I appreciate your comments. Uh, and I can't tell you the, the uh, fairly universal support that I've gotten from across the Hampton network. And it's everything that I thought it would be. Uh, the love uh, and that, that we get at Hampton University is, is uh, you know, again, I, I'm biased, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a special place. It's a very special place. And I look forward to seeing you all at homecoming. That's all there I got. Go. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, everybody, let's give uh, General Williams a big round of applause. I wish we had more time to spend um, answering questions. General, there's so many people send me individual questions, so many questions, you know. So hopefully, you know, you won't deem it robbery to come back uh, for the Leadership Academy, hopefully for the third year uh, to talk and share your, your message with us. We know you're going to be very busy uh, doing big things at, um, at Hampton University. Um, and I would like to give the last closing uh, remarks to the Urban Financial Services Coalition's national president, Ms. Ola Mae Truelove, who is in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. Uh, Ms. Ola Mae Truelove, any closing uh, remarks um, for us uh, today? Ola? I think I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, my. It's been a tough day. Good evening, Mr. Williams. How are you? And everyone with Urban Financial Services Coalition. So good to see you all. I apologize, D2, for just joining, but I'm just able to jump on and I certainly wanted to do so. Absolutely. It's always good to have you on, Madam President. And, um, and so with that, uh, we like to, one of the things my mentor has always uh, taught me is to uh, end and be end, begin and end on time. Uh, so please, please uh, be on the lookout for our next leadership sessions. I know we're going to have Daryl Matthews, the 32nd president of um, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Um, to speak as a part of the Leadership Academy. We'll have Kalai Gibson, Executive Vice President um, with Fifth Third, first highest ranking African-American in that financial institution. We have uh, Dr. Whitney, who's also going to actually take people through the process of creating a personal leadership uh, mission statement. So to take the good work that uh, General Williams has shared with us today. So with that, everybody have a great evening and we'll be talking to, with you again soon out from Richmond, Virginia. <laughs>